And are you also moving and having relationships with your things in the way that multiplies your abundance, in the way that multiplies your peace, in the way that makes your money multiply? And so you can have 200 leopard leather jackets, but also are you debt free? But also, you know, do you have land that never loses its value? But also, do you have property so you can pass that down? But also, have you healed your wounds? But also, do you have the most important thing, which is self-respect? How was the graduation, though, besides being out in the sun? What was the, uh, who graduated? A friend of ours got their master's in journalism today from um, Cal. UC yeah. Berkeley, yeah. UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big they deal. Did. I mean, it made me think about going back and getting another degree. Wow. Really? Jenna's in the front row writing yeah. all kinds of notes. Wow. Yeah, I would go what back and get another degree. <laughs> Stop it. She was, there's a keynote speaker. She said, <laughs> <laughs> What makes you feel that way? Why school? Why degrees? <laughs> I like school. Mm hmm. I don't mind school. Me I like too. school. I, I really like for my brain to expand, to read new literature. And students are just charging. They're, you know, they're always at the frontier. Mm -hmm. And it's because they are in a... The, a school is like a breeding ground for newness and thought culture. And I really enjoy that. And degrees, because I think it's a receipt that no one can take from you. Like having a degree is just a receipt. And it costs a lot of money and everyone doesn't have to do it. But for me, I'm like, yeah, I can travel all around this world and say I have a degree and get a job. Some people can't do that. They don't have that liberty. Mm. And so I don't really take it lightly. I'm like, yeah, I can. I would totally have a master's. To be a master in something? Mm -hmm. A master in something? Mm -hmm. It feels like the respect. invaluable thing. Respect. <laughs> respect. Two Ks. On my name. Respect. Respect. <laughs> And so if you could go to school to study anything, what would you study? My mind, so I started a master's program actually in South Africa. And my master's program is a global studies program. And it was going to require me to study in South Africa, part-time in Germany, and then part-time in India. Hmm. Sociology program. And what I was studying was the word colored within mm. the South African context. Yeah. And so... I lived in a neighborhood in Cape Town on the coast, and I lived in Woodstock, which is a colored neighborhood mm -hmm. um, full of colored people, which is obviously a subset in South Africa. And then I lived on a block of houses, and they were colored. So my house was pink, but my neighbor's was black, and the other one was teal. And the other one was like all, there was a yellow house, mm -hmm. like every house was a different color. And so I was going to my neighbor's homes and talking to them. So I was essentially investigating what it means to be colored within colored within colored mm -hmm. and how we're, we can all be colored. Mm. So sociology, anthropology, the study of people. That's me. I love that. Yeah. And you, Frida, would you go back to school? Would you study? I wouldn't go back. <laughs> uh, not at all. Uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> never. I mean, it's not never. It's just, I think for me... I don't enjoy school. I've mm. always been I've always been able to finesse my way in and out of it mm -hmm. um, and get what I need to get done. But I think for me right now, I'm really at a point where I'm trying to learn from people. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking recently about accreditation and like institutions. And I was like, what's the strongest institution that exists? You know, because then essentially if you go there, if you study here, if you do this, right, then people are like, okay, yeah, that, that is a receipt. And it is something that is a value, but like it's a value because the people decide that it's valuable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm much rather interested in engaging with the people mm -hmm. instead of the institution that the, the people support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just thinking, wow, I, I just, I, I, I can play by the rules really well. And I find that when I was in school, I would just play by the rules enough to get... <laughs> To get what I needed? Yeah. <laughs> to get the grades. To, get, to, to pass get, the test. Yeah, to pass the, the test. So thing. like, whatever, we're cheating through the exams. Like, okay, slide the blue book here. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I'm just at a point where I'm like, I think I'm the greatest institution that exists oh, for wow. me. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Like, 
It's a powerful thought. I'm just like, I, I'm it. Mm. Um, and, and what's crazy about schools, when you think about it, because I went to a private university, and so like accreditation was created for many different reasons, but when you think about it, it's like, okay, cool. We're in this group. We're going to say that because we're in this group, we're the hottest shit. We're the best school. We're the best group of schools. Because we said that we're the best group of schools. Oh, what tests do you need to take to get into our schools? Tests that we facilitate. Mm. Tests that we set up. Mm. So I'm like, well, let me just make a motherfucking test. <laughs> right. let, me just, let me just create the system. <laughs> let me just create this motherfucking system. <laughs> then let, let me create the exam to get into the system. <laughs> right. And then let me let me facilitate who gets who even gets to take my test. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the American education system, ladies there and gentlemen. You go. Yeah. Listen, that's <laughs> it. if I learn anything from school, it's how to play the game and win it. Right. We out here winning these right. things. Mm-mm. I think for me, if I went back to school, what I would study, and like, like if money was no option, like I really did not need a return, I would study pro Trump black people from a sociological lens, Ooh. hands down. You must have a lot of patience. Yes. To listen to people. Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, I would absolutely do that. I find them fascinating on um, sure. so many levels. I would do an anthropological study on pro-conservative blacks in America. Have you engaged with many on an individual level? No, I've watched lots of YouTube videos of those who have like taken the red pill and like have sort of evaluated their arguments. I read conservative news every day, at least three articles, and I have done that since Trump got elected. Or, right, yeah, elected as president, so about, like, a year and a half now. Um, because I needed to understand the other side. And from a, from, from a worldview standpoint, like, I just needed to understand. Because I was, like, really lost after the election. I was like, whoa, what happened? And so what I do when I get stressed is I start researching. Mm. And that's basically what I did. And so it helps me understand the constraints of their argument and worldview so then I can make decisions with mine and it also helps me understand like what to freak over and what to not as well because it's like if liberals are like "Ah!" I like go check conservative news and if they don't feel anything about it I'm like it's not you're just you're just being crazy You're you're just like yeah you're just making that up so I get to like find stable ground instead of pandemonium instead of just imagining what someone else thinks and why they're making decisions you said you read three articles a day just about on average yeah from conservative news Mm -hmm. and then what other things are you reading regularly Mm, i read a lot of news i read um i read magazines like crazy magazines are my vice um and uh books but like kind of indiscriminate books right now I don't really know at a time it was like something I was reading <laughs> like now because I'm constantly uh ingesting information I don't really know sometimes novels sometimes not what medium are you reading on laptop phone books I read on your books. news laptop. oh my news my computer because you don't have a phone Mm-mm. how long 13 years 13 years is that a cell phone, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Row from brown kids. <laughs> Everybody. I was thinking about it because I was like, fuck a phone bill. Fuck T-Mobile. I really did that. I, was, I really, because I think about it, I was like, man, you know, I need to cut expenses. Fuck T-Mobile anyway. Service not good. And I was like, all right, how long do I really think I could go without a phone? And then I was like, bitch, you get lost everywhere. You need Google Maps. I, I need Google Maps. So if there is a phone that wasn't a phone that was just Google Maps on the go, then that would help me. And then I could really be without a but phone. But how did you get around before your phone? I was lost everywhere. I was lost. <laughs> I used to go to MapQuest. Yes. We would print that shit out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then it obviously wasn't geo. It wasn't like updating per like the right. satellites. And stuff. Right. So you'd be like, oh, this street doesn't exist. <laughs> so like, I guess we're not going. And then you go home. That was it. <laughs> Google Maps revolutionized. It like it really empowered me to actually be able to go places as someone who is always getting lost. So the fact that you don't have a phone 13 years in the game or just like that tells me I learned my way around. You but I've do. always I've always had a great sense of direction. Like from yes. the beginning. I'm with you. Right? I'm with you. Yeah. I, I so I was my phone, something happened to it in Thailand. I had just gotten a new iPhone. And then it just all went to shit when I was in Thailand. Oh, no. And so I spent 
Oh, it was just over a month in Southeast Asia without a cell phone. And I, yeah, I don't like getting lost. So I also have a really good sense of direction. Mm. I remember things. I, I'm like, I can get here again and I totally. can get us home. For sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's like, I don't even understand. Lost friend over here. I don't here. even get it. Excuse me. Where is the street? <laughs> That's me. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> but I've like got two things. I so know. like in Thailand, for instance, I found my way, my partner, Aaron. I found our way to a place I hadn't seen in two years in the dark on the back of a song towel, which is like one of those covered trucks. Um, yeah, like on an unmarked road. And he was like, where have you taken us, Philippe? And I was like, trust me, I uh, I remember these rice patties. This is where we should be. Sure enough, turn the corner and there was the And there you were. There I was. Um, and then there was something else I was going to say about directions. Oh, Everyone asks me for directions, no matter where I am, like even places where it doesn't even physically make sense that I would know the information. Mm. I was in Scotland, everybody. Does this look like, and I was walking down the street and some woman crosses the street and she goes, excuse me, do you know where? And I was like, does it look like? I, I'm so sorry. I cannot help you. That's that confidence you're inv- I invoking. I think so. I just like walk around. I'm asking people, I'm like, why do they ask me where I'm going? I've been Amsterdam air, airport. People ask me for directions. I was in Boston the other time. People, people know they see a black woman. She know what she doing. Really? She going around. I don't, I don't feel like that. How can that be true? Listen, I don't make up these stereotypes. I just live the ones that work the best for me. Do people ask you advice? Yeah, I go, I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell you, but you're going to get lost. I tell them the truth. Yeah. I, I always know. <laughs> I always know until I don't know. But then I'm happy to tell them, like, I've actually never been here before. But if I've been here before, then I know. You yeah. know. Yeah, just once. All I need is once, and I can get back. So from our recent conversation, it sounds like you travel pretty frequently. Mm. That's a good thought. It's not. I don't travel as <laughs> frequently as I look like I do. But you do travel. Yes. Okay, so you have a Sometimes. bit of free time to travel. Yes. Okay. Um. Essentially, what I really want to ask you is about your lifestyle mm-hmm. and reaching freedom in general and getting free. So what does that concept mean to you and how does it bridge over, you know, your travels oh, sure. and how you Into live and your relationship, et cetera? Um, freedom to me in particular, like freedom to me is about being self-directed mm-hmm. and um, mm, like tasting how good um, it can be to direct your own life. And so there's been like many points in my life where I have come to a decision where I have a choice about if I should go this way or if I should go this way. And what excites me is the fact that I get to make the decision. And I want to make sure that there are as many parameters as possible where I get that choice and that ability to. And I think especially for people of color, we just like haven't had that ability (laughs) or we've been like straddled with all types or saddled with all types of stuff from society that prevents us from doing that. So when it came to my life and sort of being raised by my aunt who made sure that I knew how to do everything, I wanted to continue that. So how it kind of like spills over into my life is that... um, major decisions in my life, like getting out of debt or, <laughs> or um, like rethinking my clothing or rethinking uh, how I live my life or where my life was really all based on the idea of like, do I have the power to make my own choices? And whenever there's something that's in my life, say for instance, a job that I hate or something that I'm not good at or, or something that I'm like in debt to, I no longer have the freedom to make the decision over my own life. And in my mind, then something has to change immediately and so i'm like constantly thinking every day like how close am i am i free am i feeling free like what do i what do i need to be changing and so right now my lifestyle right now is like super small and like i work for myself um and i my good friend Darrell, i was catching up with him and he was like roll like you're so mysterious what, what are you working on it's true i am super mysterious <laughs> i'm very like i have lots of affect but i'm a hermit and i'm not mad at that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I get it. I'm very mysterious. And he's like, it seems like you do everything and nothing at all. And I was like, Darrell, you that get is me. so true. You <laughs> give me, thank you. Shout out to Darrell. So 
I don't, yeah, I do everything I want to do and also nothing at the same time. So everything kind of feels like Saturday, but I'm not stressed about it, nor do I necessarily think that it's privileged because I have minimized my life not to need much. I think so many people don't even know what it's like to not be stressed mm. in some capacity. Like it, it, in a lot of regards, everyone is overstretched in like multiple facets of their life. So mm -hmm. like they're overspending and then they are overworked and then they're undernourished and they get less sun than they want to and they <laughs> never get to travel, but yet they're always going somewhere. <laughs> and so you, you're just, there, there's no, there a lot of people don't feel equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Like peace, you yesterday for our conversation, you're like peace is priority. And I totally. was like, <laughs> That part. I'll take one. I'll take some of that piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. So like, uh, and I actually this yesterday, peacefulness and being that you are not anxious and most of the time, right? Every day feels like Saturday. How do you know when you're anxious and how, and how do you know how to identify it and remove remove that? Yeah, I think it's really different for each individual person mm. because I think each of us can handle a different amount of stress. I can't handle much stress. I am a terrible multitasker. And so as soon as I'm doing too many things, I'm, I'm about to like dip out, you know, and I don't know immediately, I can feel it in my body. And especially if I can't keep track of something, like if I say I'm gonna meet you, Jenna, for a meeting and then I forget, it's like, oh no, something is wrong. Like I have got too many things going. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, they're just like those, those, no, those like alerts in my life where it's like, you're off, you're off, you're off, you're off kind of thing. And so then I begin to reprioritize. Like I have to look at my schedule and I have to look at what I've committed myself to because I think the best thing that I read last year was this book called um, The Language of Happiness by Brothers Chalmers. And I love what he was saying. It was so good. He said that people don't have a time management issue. They have a commitment management issue. And they have a promise man management issue because whenever you say something, your words are not... Your words are not just descriptive forces, it's a creative force. So if you ask me, hey, Ro, can you be on the visual podcast? And I say like, yes, I have created something that hasn't existed. Yeah. An expectation as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Now we have an agreement and now something on our calendar that was not is. And I'll send you a calendar invitation real quick. <laughs> you know? And once you press yes, it's like something exists. Yeah. So... Looking at it that way, I would started looking at the things that I had going and I was like, well, how many promises do I have working at the same time? Hmm. And when you look at it that way, then you get to renegotiate and change your promises. Um, and for me, a time that schedule that works for me is like, I just need to not have a lot of things. Like, I love to be active and creative, but I can't be overtaxed. My schedule can't be really fun sure. or really full. Um, and I can't be working on too many different projects. So I just have to start saying no. And that's the hardest thing for me Ooh. to do that. But yeah, it, I just get into a crisis mode. I don't complete things. Then I get stressed and shamed and all that stuff. And then I'm paralyzed. And by the time I'm paralyzed, it's like I'm at the point of no return. And, yeah. and the creator of my own suffering. It's not somebody else's fault. Like, mm. I just said yes over and over and over again. Created my schedule. So who has the power to change it? You do. Yeah. So peace is paramount. And I have full responsibility and agency over my peace. Peace is, my, peace is paramount. <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Sell that. <laughs> Don't steal that, y'all. You listen it. Don't steal it. Peace is paramount. That's bro. Which is also another big reason I was telling you yesterday that like I don't have a YouTube or a podcast or a website or a Twitter or I, I just don't have like I and people ask us all the time like please Roni can you make that I'm like no no I'm so you you said us a couple times you yeah. name drop Rowan E mm -hmm. and you've talked about where you're not mm -hmm. um, I would love to know where you are and like who is Rowan E who is us what is we what is what is we <laughs> what is the we um, so my partner E and I run Brown Kids online, yeah. um, which is just an Instagram account uh, where we get to show how we are pursuing our liberation right now. Um, and people have joined us and come out of the woodwork and it's like exploded over the past few years. And we live up in Vallejo, California, which is 40, 
20 minutes from Oakland, but 45 from San Francisco. Um, and we live our life there. And we basically try to figure out um, how to create a beautiful space of peace for ourselves um, that's minimal and allows us to do whatever we'd like, to, allows us to move and act at the speed of thought. Um, and so, yeah, it did, we, we did not start it other than that we were a couple and that we should maybe take some pictures because he had the cell phone because I haven't had a cell phone for 13 years. So I created the Instagram account to document a road trip that we took when we first started dating. Wow. Where did you guys go? Uh, Louisiana to meet his parents or to meet his family. We just started dating. It was like a month in. He's like, Thanksgiving's coming. Do you want to meet my family? And I'm like, soon much? Uh, I was like, how are we getting there? And, you know, because I didn't have money for a plane ticket. And he's like, I was going to drive. And I was like, I'm in. And it started there. Yeah, and it started there. And I was like, we should try this thing called Instagram. Can you download it on your phone? <laughs> like, that was the beginning of it. So it was like, again, not to have a big following or anything. Like, we could care less about any of that. Mm. Yeah, and it started from there. So You mentioned really wanting to just educate people. Mm -hmm. What is it specifically that you are – yeah, what tools are you providing? What do you share? Well, I don't think, like, we want to – I think it's so interesting because I want to be careful about how I talk about it because mm -hmm. I don't really want to educate as much as I want to be about my own freedom and as much as I want to be doing the work. And I feel like when you're in the process of like unshackling yourself or you're in the process of like making big changes in yourself, that you also have a responsibility to share what you're doing. Because it is a personal endeavor, but I think, like, everyone should have it. Like, every, everyone should know. So anything that I learned, which is like, oh, I paid off my debt this way, or, oh, I rearranged my home this way, or, oh, like, I got this part of my life together, I want to be like, here you go. Like, there it is. You can have it, too. Um, and institute it and save yourself tons of money because that's going to be dope. Um, and so basically, I think what we do if we educate anything is, like, that this is possible, that you can create a life on your own terms, um, and that you have full permission to do so. And everything else is like secondary, you know, it's like, fuck it. It's like, oh yeah, it's the jar method, or it's um, uh, a capsule wardrobe, or it's like traveling minimally or whatever. Like all of those are just like tiny little pieces of the bigger uh, umbrella, which is like, what does freedom look like for you? And why aren't you running as fast as possible? toward that thing. <laughs> um, so those are them. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, I feel like our life is service and the service part of it is just to be as transparent and as generous as possible. What's great about the three things that you listed is like, yes, this freedom idea is, is so vast and revolutionary, but for me, Dead Diary, <laughs> when I was watching those goddamn videos. <laughs> I, it, it was nice to hear that people don't people aren't talking about debt, even though we all are in it. Um, <laughs> all of us. Like <laughs> like crippling debt, right? And then um and also just being like, you're just so wonderfully personable and honest and candid. Mm. Um and so it's nice to hear, you know, like your debt exists. It does it's not a reflection of who you are. It's just mm. those are just those are things that happen. Mm -hmm. And so Similarly, just hearing someone say, I can, I got out of it. I want you to as well. I want this for you. It's like, I want this for me too. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel like, you know what? You can get out of this <laughs> You can do it. You can too. Well, talk to me about your circumstance because you shared a little bit yesterday. But I'm like, I don't know. So I created Debt Diary, which was just like me, like me saying like, hi, I got a debt <laughs> once and I'm in it again. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and also, like, I just I answered a question I got over and over and over in a really shitty way and mm. felt really bad about that. And again, I do not have a website. I do not have a YouTube. I do not have a podcast. I was not going to write this stuff down. So I right. had to make, like, Instagram work. Mm. So that's the only reason. So I filmed myself talking about my debt and how I got out of it for 10 days. Um, and I wasn't about to do it because I felt sick the day before. I felt like, oh, I'm going to lose all these people and they're going to lose all of their uh, trust, respect for me. Yeah. Um, but you said you watched it. Like, you. that's when you found out about brown kids or that's, something? Like, what happened? What was that experience for you? 
So for Dead Diary, yeah. um, I was watching it on Instagram because I was, yeah, we have mutual friends. And so they're like, this lady's amazing. She's doing dope things in Vallejo. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I go to your page and I'm looking at Dead Diary and I'm like, me, motherfucking <laughs> too. And it was, just, I'm clicking through it. I'm clicking through it. And honestly, it was just like the fact that what $11,000 in 11 months. So I was like, I got less than $11,000. Come on. So I had, I think like four, four or five K, three or three or four K. And I was like, how quickly, quickly can you pay this off? And so I was like, okay, well, let's think about this. It really was just like the thought, just like, even mm. just be like, you don't have to keep paying $60 a month when you know that's not doing shit for you and these goddamn bills. So I was like, all right, let's, like, let's, like, like, let's get this real. So I was like, okay, where am I really spending money? Where can I really save money? So I downloaded Mint, the app, because a friend told me to download Mint because he's cool in finance. And I was like, yeah, I'm spending like $800 on food, okay? Because I'm going for lunch. Lunch is $18. Then, At I, go least. To, then I go to Wingstop, six piece combo, lemon pepper, all drugs. <laughs> That's another $12. That's $30 day so essentially i spend like 30 dollars a day on food and i was like you gotta cut that shit out <laughs> you gotta cut that shit out and so i did that and i did that for like maybe six weeks and i was able to pay that off Whoa. because i was because i had like had some savings and all you the paid things. off five thousand dollars or four thousand dollars in six weeks yes because i was like playing games so I, <laughs> it was like it was the food i was also getting these bi-weekly manicure pe- gel i was getting gel right. manicures and gel pedicures right. i was like Bitch, I understand. ain't nobody looking at your feet so put your feet away <laughs> <laughs> just wash them and stop playing around but the thing the thing was the idea that you know i, I was thinking about this just not having to work in corporate and i was like well i definitely don't want any bills that i don't need to be paying mm-hmm. right like bills that I could pay off, can we pay them off? And I was just like, let's just assess the situation and cut things out. Mm-hmm. And I just feel so much lighter. Mm-hmm. And I remember you you saying, you know, when you look at it, when you look at that 11K and then one day you see it's at zero, I, I remember I was oh, in, man. I sent the last payment, I was in my bed, I sent it to Chase and I was like, played you. <laughs> You're not gonna keep playing me, I played you. <laughs> It's like the ultimate feeling of accomplishment, right? Oh, my God. And also surprise. Mm. It's like shock. It's like the thing that you didn't even know you were capable of, which is me because I have, like, I love it. I love to hear other people who talk about money being like, no, I've always been good at it. Or like those who are, um, like, organized or whatever and telling you how to do your life. And they're like, well, you know, I've, I've always was really particular about how, you know, my uh, crayons were together. And I was like, that was not me. Mm-hmm. I I don't have any kind of discipline. I'm like, all the things I want, I want them all. Um, and I never want to say no to myself. So the fact that, like, I had that same kind of feeling yes. to look at the number and you're like, look what I did. What I can do. Yeah. Look what I can do. Like, you know, and the thing is, like, you you rack up that debt over, it. when you look back at it, all of the expensing, it's... From 2016. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm like, I'm holding on to, I don't even have these items anymore. Right. Literally the thing, new shit to pay for. New shit right. to pay for. And I'm paying a bill what, on something I don't even own anymore. <laughs> right. That's what makes me so upset. I'm just right. like, I have new shit to pay for. And I'm paying someone for old shit that like is broke or I don't have anymore. Just like ridiculous. Right. Owing people money is the worst thing. And then I think it's, you know, owing money. And a lot of people don't know that all of that credit really just, that outstanding credit fucks up your real credit the valuable credit oh, that you need sure yeah the indispensable and i think the thing about that i love that point that point that you made about credit it was so good it was like yeah it's the things that you used to have that you're not even paying but also i paid off eleven thousand dollars in credit card debt but i that wasn't my balance my balance was seven thousand or i think like got you on that good good interest then 23 apr that's what they got me on. And when I did the math and I was like, oh, wait, I borrowed seven and I have to pay. And I did all of the math and I was like, oh, I paid you $11,000. You charged me on money that you gave me. Extra. <laughs> you charged me more. You charged me for taking yeah. money out. 
and but I get, you gotta and, have it. Yeah, as you well. gotta have it. And I like get it. the thought of it, which I think is like the silliest thing ever to prove that you're a credible person. Uh, <laughs> but, like you, that at some point you didn't have money and that you paid it back is basically the principle of that, which is like, okay, we can trust you because you didn't have cash to pay for it. But that's the, that's the system. That's a lie, right? Because <laughs> the credit the credit has, credit works lie. for people with money. Right. So yeah. people who have money, they're like, yeah, open up a credit card, use 30 percent, pay that shit off. Boom. Credit score is crazy, crazy wild. Great. People without money, it's it's they literally it's it, literally set up for you it. to fail. And then if you have money, it's set up for you to, again, systems right. applauding people who they made the systems for. Right. It's ridiculous. And I think we talked yesterday and we wanted to say a little bit more about it, of like what's good credit and what's other, what's like bad credit. Let us because know. Because you just said it, Frida, like you dropped the 30%. So like your credit score is based on how much money that you have borrowed. So you have your total. So say for instance, you have a credit card and it's $10,000. Um, <clears throat> so you have a $10,000 credit limit. If you borrow over half of that money, it affects your credit. Bad for you. You can only really, and they don't tell you. This is nowhere, this information. The they, banker is not sitting you down going, they're not. so what I don't want you to do is this, this, and this. They go, here, you just sign. <laughs> here you go. And your credit limit is $10,000. You can pay it off. Here's your interest. Good luck. And they don't tell you anything. They don't tell you about like how many of these, and they want you to get like seven credit cards every time you fly somewhere. They mail the, them to your house. Yeah. Discover, lose my address. <laughs> Stop it. I don't want you. So if you have multiple lines, including your student loans, that's super bad for your credit. If you borrow over half of your balance, that's bad for your credit. And also the like the frequency of which you pay. So if you default, that applies to your credit as well. And so all of those things that we don't know affect our credit. We wonder why we wake up and we have like a 480 credit score. Yeah. How'd that happen? It's like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't. There was all these things that people forgot to tell you. But if you're able to have like two or three lines, um, pay it back regularly, only borrow up to 30%. You should be okay. And then you can buy your house or get your apartment. But I tell you, you're not buying a house or getting an apartment with bad credit. And we talked about that as well yesterday. Mm -hmm. People of color, marginalized groups of people in general, how owning a house, having a house, mm -hmm drastically changes the trajectory of your family. Yeah, it's pivotal. Yeah, it's absolutely pivotal. And if you don't have it, then you you can't have assets, you can't buy land. And so it affects generations seven years out. Sure. Yeah. You brought some fun things with you today. I want to switch yeah. to like the artifacts and the things that you own that you brought with <laughs> mm. for I, your starter kit. Yeah, I did not... I did not think about how to tell the story about these things. I it's typically okay. like thinking. Well, why'd you pick them? Maybe just then, <laughs> like as you that? as you were thinking about them, what was yeah. the thought? All right, so this is my like first thing, um, which is a bunny that my mother bought me. This is like the only thing that I have that she's bought for me. I think, um, and my mother passed away when I was three. Mm -hmm. I think she passed away of sort of like health issues or whatever. And my father passed away the same year. So I was like orphaned really, really early. And so she bought me um, this bunny or something and I still have it and I will still have it. And I hope we get to talk about, you know, sort of like holding things later of like sentimental value. So this is, to me, is important to me and what I want to share because I think it's so formative. Like I grew up in Oakland I was raised in Oakland at a time when like Oakland was crazy. It was like crack cocaine was in our communities, but it was still new. And so my parents are involved and we're slinging it and stuff. And we're really, really good at what they were doing. And then it became a time in Oakland's history where it became like really dangerous and violent was surprising a lot of people. So it wasn't just like the new thing that you could make to make money. Um, <clears throat> and to me, this like contextualizes my experience, but also helps me understand how much of a miracle my life is um, and how grateful I am for it. And also what's the work that I have to do. So like people look at the Instagram and it looks like really beautiful and nice and they make tons of assumptions when they make assumptions that I make tons of money I've lived under the poverty line for five years um and they might assume that like I came from a middle class lifestyle and like never went through anything and they don't know that I was orphaned at three in a really sort of like traumatic experience um that 
you would only find in like a movie somewhere. Um, and so I remember those things. I, it uh, reminds me of the quote that Anne Lamott says, which she says like, I know where I am and I know where I was and you just can't get there from here. <laughs> you just can't get here from there. Um, and that's how I feel about my life. And I'm like, yeah. So I'm super grateful. Um, and I, I just, I just love this, this bunny. And I just don't think I'll ever get rid of it. Do and they, then, do they um, have a name? No, it doesn't. I never named it. Doesn't never have a name. named it. Yeah, and it doesn't have a gender either. Like I'm not like the girl bunny or like sure. her or whatever. It's just the bunny. And you've had her through years of moving. Mm -hmm. Can you explain your attachment to it? Um, because I didn't know my mother. I can't remember her. Um, and also she was a little bit of like the black sheep of the family. It's hard to know her because the only thing that you can know is the stories that people tell about this person. And you just know that that wasn't it. So there was like really confused, um, maybe even like bitter or hurt stories about who she was. I haven't heard really like a good positive story about who she was as a girl. And so this is my only connection between this person and me. Um, and a picture that I got a few years ago of her as a toddler. A uh, toddler or like an elementary school student. It's a school picture. I love it so much. Uh, and so she's the biggest stranger in my life. Yeah, she's just a big question mark. Um, so I hold this because I, at some point, we all need to understand where we're coming from. So we know where we're going. So that's why I hold on to it. <laughs> so like uh, looking at this and hearing you talk about it makes me think about a lot of the things we talked about yesterday mm -hmm. um specifically how you said like she's a big question mark but i'm sure you know you've inherited some things totally. from her yeah and like from your fa family we were talking about genealogy and the things that are kind of passed down especially around trauma um, and we were talking about hoarding in specific what do you think in relation to this, at least, because you wouldn't consider yourself a hoarder. You're a minimalist, right? You don't have many things, but you've kept this. Mm. That's interesting. Um, what are you holding on to with it? Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. So there's one thing, which is like the assumption that I hold things lightly, which is not true. Like I live minimally and I live an intentional life as the kindest thing that I can do to myself. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's a form of, um, self-love and self-care because I have a shopping addiction and because I'm prone to hoard. Um, and all of that comes from fear. So my life is small, not because like, I don't like things. My life is small because I love things so much and I like overwhelm myself. Um, and this particular one, like what I'm holding on to, which I don't think I've thought about in a deep way, is I am holding on to the idea of this person, but I'm also holding on to like, whew, I feel myself getting emotional. I'm also holding on to like the sweetness of who I imagine this person to be, even if it wasn't even like prevalent, like even if it was the stories that everyone told about her, um, which is that like she was untrustworthy or lied all the time or like, or um, was not a person that you can depend on. There was something that she wanted to give and extend to me that she couldn't like give as a parent. And so because I can, I can only know her in the gestalt of that, um, it's like my one little tender moment that I can keep in my mind until I can release it and then it's done. Um, and so I say to myself, like, I'll never get rid of it. That's not true. <laughs> you know, like I might lose it. That's fine. Not like <clears throat> in transit, but in fire. And I need to be okay with that. But I'm more looking forward to like a moment where I can have a sense of peace around it and then sort of let it go, which I think is, 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 is more helpful or like is, is more, uh, pivotal, um, instead of having the intention to keep everything we have, everything that matters for the rest of our lives. I think it's, it's a better approach to think about like to have this relationship we're exploring where what our things mean to us. And when we find that thing, then we can release and let it go. <clears throat> That's a good question. 
Um, but I'd love to talk more about that genealogy thing as well. Um, and what we pass on, because it's totally true. Like also the other thing is we finding out in epigenetics that the trauma that we experience in further generations gets passed on into our DNA. And then we're in our environment and something in our environment triggers that DNA sort of chromosome to switch on. <laughs> and then it's like in our bodies um, or whatever. And there's been a incredible research to show that there are things that we can do in this lifetime in our experience to heal ourselves and turn the gene off. So more so than this question of like, what am I bringing or inheriting from my parents and bringing on, which is like a greater question, which is like, what am I passing on internally? Um, and what is worthy to pass on and what is complete? Sure. Yeah. So I want to be in that work. Um, and I really think that there's a big relationship to our parents that are sort of hoarding. But I'd love to hear, because I heard a little bit about Frida's situation with hoarding, but you were like, oh, I have someone who hoards too. Mm -hmm. And like, what is your, like, what is that? You don't have to say who, but what does the sure. hoarding look like? And what do you think about it? Yeah, I think hoarding is prevalent in my family. I like, as I sit and talk about this now, I can think about the very few times that I went to my grandmother's house in Texas and us not even really being able to go in her house because mm. it was just like wall to wall with things. And it makes me think about my father in his current state, who lives in a six bedroom house. And he just allowed some of my other family members to move in. And he's like, you know, sometimes this six bedroom house feels small for one person. Um, and his thing that he holds on to is a lot of snacks, like candy, <laughs> Laffy Taffy. Yes. Like his snack pantry is just wall to wall with various snacks. And so I wonder if it has things to, I think it's a gene that's been triggered in him, mm, right? Sure. Um, yeah, specifically around the candy. And my dad has, I mean, yeah, bless his heart. He has diabetes, right? Like mm. he, he, he's already dealing with his own health constraints, but still that there's an attachment. And if I think about stories he's told me, I'm like, I can think about a story he told me that, you know, his aunt was fighting with him over some candy, right? And so it, it, may, it may actually be that, that story that triggered him. Those traumas that he too hasn't been able to let go of. Which is really crazy because I find now, like, I hide things from myself because I'm just mm. always going through things and putting mm. things away and throwing things away. And, like, mm -hmm. whenever I move, my mom was like, you guys need to have one bag of trash. Like, there has to be one bag of trash out of your room. And so now I'm always throwing things away. And now I'm like, where is it? Like, I know I had it. I put it in this drawer. I so things get, like, <laughs> lost in the process. So of me, I think, maybe trying to evade the same kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Because you want something different from yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, Frida, your context yeah. with hoarding? Yeah. Many people in my family hoard. Uh, I think it's uh, very much a class thing and also uh, mm. uh, what do you call when people are dis a displacement thing? Oh, sure. <clears throat> right? So, you know, have you, ever, have you ever gone somewhere and thought you packed something? And then you realize you get there and it's not there. Mm -hmm. And how upset you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a displacement with my lineage of just people moving around and needing to move places. Um, and so I wonder if that's why they keep things. Mm. Um, similarly, my, my, yeah, one of my grandmothers, she just has a bunch of stuff in her house everywhere. She won't let people inside. And to think a house mm -hmm. where people that's the functionality of a home is mm -hmm. that people would be able to go in there mm -hmm. but you can't like oh you can't bring your friends there you can't bring boyfriends there my mom wouldn't wasn't able to bring my my dad into her mom's house for mm -hmm. a long time and so there's definitely trauma there um and i just I try to, I, I, I will get rid of things angrily. And so I'm working to like not be that person. Yeah. So I'll find old pictures, right, of boyfriends and be like, get this shit out. <laughs> and, I, and I just like, I want to be in a place, because I, I, I'm also prone to hoarding. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's definitely some, like a trait I could easily pick up. Mm. Um, and so I'll, I'll just like get rid of things and like cast them aside and be like, you don't need this. And then... Uh, it's not from a place of like I'm actually done with these things. Sure. It's from a place of like let's just get them out of yeah. here. Um, it's just compulsive in a way. It's a compulsive yeah. getting rid of things. Um, so I'm trying to be more in an equilibrium. But I just think it's incredible. 
uh, when I when I present certain things to my family members, because there are other family members too that hoard, um, and like this is you know like what is this? And they're just like, oh, just keep it. Mm. Some of the things are just crumbled. Yeah, like not anything. Why do you need this? When was the last time you wore this? Whose is this? <laughs> do you even know? Yeah, do you know? And so I I really do. I assess it as like d- d- trapped. Yeah, and it feel it's so. It's exhausting to be around it because you can feel that they're trapped by these things. Even if mm. you ever, if you've ever seen a homeless person with like racks and racks of things, you're just like, I mean, you could be the most mobile person, but like you're holding on to these things. You want to be trapped in, you don't want to be trapped, but you're trapped in this. Mm-hmm. And it just, I, I, yeah, I don't even know how to even begin these conversations to help people see that they, that they are trapped. Right. Yeah. So. And I wonder if you should. I mean, so I was reading um, an article by Ariel Bernstein. It's an Atlantic article. And she talks about Marie Kondo and the privilege of clutter. And Ariel is a the first generation child of Polish parents who met in Cuba when they were expelled from Poland. They created a business for, with one another. And then they got expelled from Cuba, came to America. Mm-hmm. And so what happened was that they hoarded. And so she wrote this article to say that, like, Marie Kondo, if you've heard of her, the person who wrote The Magic of Tidying Up, Marie Kondo uh, sort of thinks beautifully that you can just, like, hold on to things that bring you joy and then, like, get oh. rid of the things that don't. Okay. <laughs> um, which is, like, her method of cleaning. And it's, it's super effective. It's been really, really important for people. But she goes on to say in this article, she was like, I completely disagree with that. Like refugee parents don't didn't have anything to hold on to. And so don't blame them for being in this life and like holding on to everything. Mm. And what what bothered me so much about that kind of thinking is to say that like without thinking about what happened to your parents and and articulating and understanding that what they're going with trauma, if you're not talking about what their experience is a traumatized experience, then you're being silly and unserious. Mm. And the, the next question, as she's like, I get rid of things as well. And, you know, it was a compulsive as well because she didn't want to, like, replicate what her parents had gone through. The more important question would be to ask ourselves, okay, so... What's the trauma that they that they faced? Mm. What's the trauma that I have inherited in my DNA and also sort of socialized? And what can I do to heal these things? In what ways are my parents and my family not facing these things? And if I can't change them, which I don't think we should go into any situation trying to change our family. Sometimes mm. you're just going to be hoarders. But we have the opportunity to think about ourselves, like how do we honor our lineages and our genealogy and the experiences they went to, through and what's worth passing on and what is worth saying it is complete. And the thing is, is like people, when they find out like I'm minimalist or whatever, they like start apologizing and they're like, I like things and options or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> I don't even, like, I don't care. Like, I don't care if you have a collection of leopard leggings, you know, that you just want to have or like leopard jackets. You've got a thing. I don't care if you have 200 leather leopard jackets. That's fine. And are you also moving and having relationships with your things in the way that multiplies your abundance, in the way that multiplies your peace, in the way that makes your money multiply? And so you can have 200 leopard leather jackets, but also are you debt free? But also, you know, do you have land that never loses its value? But also, do you have property so you can pass that down? But also, have you healed your wounds? But also, do you have the most important thing, which is self-respect? And so to me, at the end of the day, Today, now, us is the opportunity. What ends with us and what will continue after us. And I think that is the worthy conversation. And there's not anything about sort of like the privilege of clutter or that like we, you know, it's a fine that Americans can talk about clutter because they can buy new things. Um, <laughs> but you say new things at her house. I tell you that. <laughs> This shit ain't new. You know, and it's like, have you ever have you ever lived in a home, you know, where like you couldn't sleep in your room or like yeah. a parent or a relative or or a you know, whatever has like five or six closets. 
And also I understand the reaction of our, our parents, whether we're first generation or whether we come from refugee families or whether we come from black communities where things have been taken away from us our entire lives. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like I totally understand that. And also why do things accumulate? And like, how is this contributing to the health of the family, the health of you, the health of them? Um, and I think that we need to be honest about that and can also, again, I want to say again, like honor everything that they've done and that we have an opportunity um, to decide, really, to come back to choice and to freedom. What does liberation look like from then on? Because the way that they survived was helpful. And now in what ways do we need to survive now? And those things are not the same. Mm -mm. Those things are not the same. And so that's kind of how I think about that and how I think that you can have this conversation from a really intentional point of view that I think resonates and makes a lot of sense with those who have to take care of their community or who come from collective cultures. I don't think living this way is an individualistic experience. I think it has to do with everything and everyone who are responsible for so I'm happy to talk about it in that way. And I wish that we had more of an opportunity to, um, because again, it was the way that I healed myself. It's just so nice to hear other black women talking about hoarding, because I remember that I feel like when I used to watch episodes of Hoarders, I would see a lot of like white middle America. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch a lot of episodes, but when I did tune in, they were white. <laughs> And then I was like, well, damn, my family must just be hella crazy because we also could be on the show. Um, and and so, yeah, just to see like this is a it's a mental health issue mm -hmm. right within the black community. And, and as we continue not to do, we're not talking about them enough. And so hoarding is definitely something that uh, I'm glad we're not alone in. It's not, and it's not diminishment either. It makes tons of sense. And I think Ariel was trying to say that, just like to have empathy for those that it's difficult to let go. And I think absolutely. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. We need to understand those, those like factors and influences and stuff. Yes, of course. Uh, and what next? And like, and what is your responsibility? Um, so I feel like it's a little, to be harsh, um, lazy to say, that um, someone else who supports a lifestyle that benefits your mental health um, and your freedom and your peace and sort of em emotional healing um, to sort of like scapegoat that person and to point a finger at them and to say that like, you don't understand the situation of what's going on. You know, it seems um, a little untruthful and it also seems like you're giving up your your agency and your responsibility um, instead of like looking at where you come from and developing an incredible amount of passion and then taking a moment to ask yourself, okay, so what am I going to do? It's a different reality, you know? And I think that's the type of work that I want to be doing in my own life. Um, I would say that. So I guess like coming from your like very present experiences because I've got hoarders in my family too. In your experience of, of relatives who have things, I guess I can ask the question to you, like what's a choice that you want to make moving forward? For the next generation. Mm -hmm. For the children. <laughs> and it can be esoteric. Like what I want to pass on is... Um, Clarity and determination and um, confidence and assuredness. Mm. It could be something like that. It could be like, I want to pass on the ability to take care of my things and have a clear space. I want to pass on kind of whatever. I find myself getting emotional. So I'm holding it in. Okay. For the moment. <laughs> I want to pass on... I would like to pass on... I think a curiosity for the world and new things and new people. I'd like to pass on... Hopefully an incredible sense of freedom, but not through teaching 
but through food and through music and dance parties in the morning and beach dates. I want to pass on an understanding of self and things in relation to self and self in relation to self. And the understanding of joy, because happiness is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Got teary eyes just listening to you. (laughs) (laughs) I said yesterday, this would be the first episode. (laughs) You try to wipe your eyes like a diva, so you don't (laughs) smear the the shit out. (laughs) Um... You know, I'm getting emotional because my family's on um, our studio equipment back there. So my mom's at the top there. My grandmother's uh, down there. And um, I will say, I think there are. There's a lot of trauma. Family's been in America for a very long time. We've been here. We (laughs) built this country. Um, There's a lot of trauma, and I think um, that that historical trauma I would like to close. Mm -hmm. So so I'm not really answering your question. I'm answering something else that I really like that you said. It's like, this is how we survived before. Mm -hmm. This is not how we need to survive now. Mm. Um, And a lot of their survival is, is based off of like, existing in trauma and they did a really good job of making a space where I didn't really have to go through a lot of trauma I mean I went through my own but you know no one was spraying me with the you know I gotta go to school white kids and like white kids love me and white people love me and I work in tech you know all these things like I'm really an anomaly for my family even just to exist I'm just an anomaly and so uh, I don't want myself to be an anomaly. I don't want to be the I don't want to be the one shining star. Not to say that there aren't other shining stars, but yeah, I think for me, I'm really just trying to radically change the trajectory of the whole clan. Mm. Um, so that's that's what I would want to leave for my family. So everyone thinks like I knew from early on, I really could do whatever I want. President was black. I was like, yeah, about time. <laughs> I've, you know, Wakanda came out. I was like, "Yeah, facts. We're kings and queens." I've been, I've been saying this. I've been saying this. Um, but you know, some of my family never knew that. Hmm. Some of my friend, some people I knew in high school never knew that. Um, and so, I, I like to be able to share that with the world. Mm-hmm. Mm. I love that so much. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Maybe thank you for sharing those things. I'm just incredibly appreciative of, yeah, you have an I don't care mentality, but it's really one that is free. It's not like I don't care, fuck it, negative. It's like I don't care because I'm free. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm joyful. You're challenged. You're going through your own processes. You're dealing with real things, and and you're free, and you encourage us all to be more free. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing Mm -hmm. I want to give you an opportunity to share any last things that you want to share on the show before we close. And then I want you to follow up with telling us where we can find you, what we should be keeping our eye out for, specifically the jar method, (laughs) because that's my thing. (laughs) She said, Dead Diaries, I'm for the jar method. We already got jars in our kitchen. We're like, oh, we're going to just try it. We really need the manual so we could do it. We were one of those people who put our produce in two jars just to try it, and it stayed for a week longer fresh. Yeah, Yeah, that was us. So I want you to talk about that. Um, So I think... Just the last thing to say, like, our relationship online is so different than I think a lot of other people. And yeah, we have a big following now, but it was never under the impression that, like, we wanted to get numbers. Like, we're just we're just not interested in that. We're, like, the worst influencers ever. Like, people are always trying to send a shit. And we're like, sorry, got that. Can't have that. No space for it. No need. Um, 
And so I'm always like, sorry, we're minimalists. Like, like this is so hard. Um, but I also, again, really love it because there's no kind of strings attached. Like we're not trying to parlay numbers so we can have a partnership um, and a sponsored post with Target. I mean, we could really care less. Um, so everything that we do is really like more the merrier, you know, because I, I want really want people to know, like you might not know, but we all get in free. Um, so you can come and join us there and like, that's kind of what's happening there. And there's also this really great community that's people are, when I say it's a community, I mean, it's a community. I mean, people are helping one another. People have become friends just by hanging out with us online. Um, and it made changes in their lives, like paying off three credit cards or like getting rid of 10 bags of clothes. Like it is really encouraging and edifying people to be better for themselves. And I'm here for it. Um, you can hang out with us at, at Brown Kids on Instagram and something that you should look out for, like a big question I get all the time. And I talk about it in Debt Diary, which is in the highlights if you want to watch it, um, is what is it? Oh yeah. Like how did you get out of debt? And a big way that we got out of debt is we standardized a food cost and how we standardized, standardized a food cost was the jar method, which was, I was sick and tired of how much money we were spending. And I also wanted to get out of debt. So I was like, I'm going to figure this out, how to get this food stuff together. Did tons of research, put some things into place. And then I shared it with the Instagram community and it just like exploded. People like, ah, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, and then I tried to do like Instagram posts and it just wasn't enough. So I created a way where people can watch it because people were bothering me for two years about it. And so the jar method, it's like a 70 minute workshop and it shows you everything you need to know. Um, and I recommend it because people are like, you just put it in jars. And I'm like, no, if you just put it in jars, I wouldn't have had to make like a 70 minute thing because we want everyone to save money from the beginning. Like even before you go grocery shopping to how you buy, then you store and like how you make meals. So you can keep your promises to yourselves to be like, I'm going to eat in and like really mean it. Um, and yeah, it's like, it's coming out this week. You should absolutely buy the ticket and don't follow people who like haven't really taken it. Cause I've seen some posts from people and they're like, I just wash my greens, put it in jars and I refrig like I put it in the refrigerator. And it's like, that's cool. That's gonna last an extra week. That's not really But I the really method. want you it to last three weeks. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know? they just got so excited and they saw pictures and it's like, I feel you. And I also really want to make sure that like you save even more money than you could possibly think of. So um, yeah, uh, get the jar method, change your life, uh, save your life, save your money. Um, and I also do a money back guarantee. I haven't had one person ask me for their money back. Incredible. Yeah. Out here getting free. <laughs> yeah. We all going to get free. We're all doing it. We're all doing it. Yeah. Liberation in many forms. Yeah. Well, Amazing. Bro, I think what's incredible about you is that you want to teach people so that they don't need you anymore. Mm. You're not trying to get people to buy into something so that they can need to subscribe to you and, and, and that you're the answer. Mm -hmm. You promote that everyone is their own answer. Mm -hmm. And that's revolutionary. Mm. And so I know from Jenna and I, we're grateful for you for sharing these answers, speaking with us. And encouraging us, encouraging our audience to be free. Been in this country a long time, some of us longer than others. <laughs> but everyone should be free, mm -hmm. everyone around the world. And not a lot of people want people to have that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are actively working to make sure that other people can't be free. Yeah. Whether they're physically holding them into bondage or they're selling them something that is going to kill them mm. or many other things. And that's not your platform. And that's why we wanted you on the show. And that's why I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. Um, so blessed. We're so blessed. Please follow Ro everywhere. <laughs> Her and Erin. Erin's the homie too. <laughs> follow them on Instagram at Brown Kids. Brown Kids. Yep. Brown Kids. One word. At Brown Kids. We got Kids. into Instagram early. People were like, you must have. Right. <laughs> we're like, yeah, like the first year. <laughs> We were there. <laughs> yeah. We were there. We found them. We're brown. We're and we had like 900 followers for like four years. So oh. I don't know. It's just exploded. So. And now the community is skyrocketing. So if you want to be a part of that community, follow them. Do it. Follow the journey. Free yourself. Yeah, free yourself. I'm not interested in anything else.
It's beautiful. And so officially, this is Frida, Jenna, and Ro <laughs> on another phenomenal episode of It's a Look. And that's a wrap. <laughs>